By the way, someone said that Theo looked like he had the he had the pee. Is that the face I make? Am I am I holding it in like that? <sighs> it might be true. Let's get started. Languages Go is certainly one of them. I'm not known for being a big Go fan, but over the years I've by the way, he's not when he says not being a big Go fan, he's actively said Go is like the single worst language he has ever used. So this is like this is a crazy take, okay? This is crazy, the fact that Theo is is saying this. I mean, he's Theo's an anti. Theo's an anti go. Okay. He he's been an anti, so that's why this is so interesting. Started to come around to it a bit. Not because I enjoy writing it. I don't think that will ever happen, but because I see the value it brings to developers and to the industry as a whole. It's a lot of good things I use every day that are built with Go, like ES Build, Vitesse for handling our MySQL databases, and even Docker. There's also some bad things like Kubernetes Terraform and the GitHub CLI. The man hates Kubernetes, okay? But to be completely fair, I'm sure Vercel probably uses Kubernetes, and so he likes using Kubernetes. He probably just doesn't like implementing Kubernetes. Okay, can we be can we be real there for a second? You like using them K8s? Don't like don't like don't like uh, implementing them. Yeah, yeah, uh, Regardless, no one's blaming him. Go no allows one's blaming people him. to build things quickly that are relatively fast in runtime as well. I just posted this diagram on Twitter, and the response was loud, but largely agreement. The goal here was to point out the ways that all of these languages are both faster and also slower than other ones. We could I don't actually fundamentally agree that TypeScript has more developer velocity than Go. At this point, I've used Go now for a couple weeks, like actively. And I've used TypeScript for, oh gosh, a decade. And I'm almost as fast in Go than I am on TypeScript. But I'm only two weeks into this old Go business. You know what I mean? Maybe three weeks. TS, uh, TS has more DX if you're interested in all things web. But a nightmare if you're not invested. Uh, if you're not, I mean, that's that's where my big uh, runtime. This is absolutely true. I, I think none of us can, uh, none of us would argue this top one or this bottom one. Go is just fast as fast as crap to compile. It's it's it, it's runtime not as good as Rust, but significantly better than TypeScript. Compi compilation significantly faster than TypeScript. It's just the middle. This is where the argument comes down to, which is, do you believe this? I'm curious about Rust long term still. I'd, li I'd, I'd want to see a bunch of lightly invested 9 to 5 Andes write Rust for a year, and I would like to see how their application goes. Do you know what I mean? Gorm is trash? Yeah, that's why everyone uses uh, Squeal C. But I'm, I'm actually curious about that because Rust, if you get a bunch of people who are very good at Rust, I could see it probably being pretty good. But the reality is, is that most companies, they're, they're just a bunch of people that are just there. They're just there to be there. They're not there to be the greatest person ever. And so if you have like just a bunch of nine to five, I don't, I just want to clock in, write, clock out. I don't want to think about things. I'm curious how fast Rust would actually, how fast it would actually go. Would it, would it actually maintain a nice, like, would you be able to deliver features or not? Go, you can do that with nine to fivers with Go. Damn, you can move fast, right? If you're only writing front ends, I could understand why TS is appealing. But the moment you're writing a library, TS goes closer to Rust because everybody wants the craziest autocomplete where you hand in some sort of object and out comes all of its properties as dot separators and everything. I wouldn't use Rust for application code. Neither would I. I like, I like Rust for, well, I mean, unless if it's like CLI stuff. I like it for CLIs. Go is easier to master than Rust or JS. Yes, Go is easier to master. Like, I bet you if you took a, if you just took any random person who has never programmed, I think it would be easier for any one of them to develop a comprehensive CLI in Go with the shortest amount of time. Lies? You think so? You think that's a lies? I think, I think, I think Go would be the shortest amount of time. Anyways, you can see here in the runtime thoughts. performance that Rust obviously wins. It's crazy what happens when you manage all of your memory yourself. But when you compare that to something like Golang, where you don't manage the memory, garbage collection handles it for you, you can move significantly faster when you're not worrying about the borrow checker and all of these individual parts. Obviously, the size of the TypeScript ecosystem and the lack of checking things, generally speaking, you can move faster in TypeScript. See, that's the thing is that the, the size of the ecosystem, I actually think hurts. I think it genuinely hurts TypeScript. Uh, there's 10 separate CSV parsers, some in JavaScript, some in TypeScript. Sometimes they don't have type libraries and you have to figure out how to provide them. Uh, there's like a whole bunch of barriers that you have to really think about with TypeScript. Whereas Go, most of the things that you use TypeScript for are just freely available on the standard. You want a templating, you want to just do some basic templating, it's in Go. 
You, you want to do some basic operations over arrays, it's already in Go standard library. You want to do pretty much anything. Oh, you want to just create a quick TCP server or a quick HTTP server? Already in Go and has pathing and it has everything, right? Like most of the things you've ever wanted are already in Go. That's why it's so interesting. But again, that's web server. I noticed I said all web server things. It's the web side of things. Is that TypeScript... Is that what makes it good? I mean, I can, I can agree with that. Like, if you're developing an application, I think it's kind of wild to try to... I don't think Wasm's there. Can we be real? I don't think Wasm's there. I think that if you're just developing for the web, I think TypeScript will probably remain king for quite some time. There's a lot of Go and Infra. Yeah, Go is like the primary thing in Infra. Wasm's really awesome, but I'm not going to lie to you. It, it's, it's very... It's like, it's, it's hard. It's not a great development. Wasm doesn't touch the DOM. We're not there yet. Yeah, and even all the DOM, like, crossover and things you can do... To like touch the DOM, it's very ASM. I dude, I <laughs> there's a lot of ASM. All right, uh, but oh, man, I've already lost my train of thought due to ASM pick. I read ASM and just lost it. I lost it. I actually can't remember what I was gonna say. If you disagree with this, you haven't worked in both languages for long enough. You can move faster in TypeScript meaningfully. Your code will be slower for sure. And I I don't agree with that. I think it depends. I I think I think when he says these things, so. To be completely fair, when he says these things, I think he's talking about web development specifically. So I think he's he is probably correct in the sense that if you're just doing web development, then it makes a thousand times more sense with TypeScript to say that you can move faster. If you have a one-person team, maybe you could say you could move faster because you're writing just a singular singular code base for both. I still think actually just using uh, JS doc, JavaScript for the front end and go for the back end, HTMX in the middle, you will simply move faster. Uh, that's that's personal. That's a personal opinion on this one. I could maybe see why he's coming to that, but I, I'd say if you're writing infra, you're writing anything to do that's just like a program that runs, you're going to get way faster developer velocity right here. Even maintenance might be a bit harder in TypeScript, but the speed... All right, Shirai, L take, hit me. Hit me with, hit me, hit me with it, Shirai. VIP L take, come on, make it happen. Lay it down on my face. Laravel, Rails, Phoenix, greater than web... <laughs> I knew it was going to be this son of a bitch. I knew this son of a bitch was going to say this. I knew he was going to come in with some, just some wild, just some left field. And I knew Elixir was going to be mentioned. I just knew it. I do think it's hilarious that Rails is thrown in on that one. That one we maybe are going to have to disagree on the Rails part. I guess I haven't done enough Rails to know. You go from 0 to 1 or even 1 to 10 in TypeScript is unmatched. But then we get the compilation times where Go is I, I, comically faster than all of the other options. Something that I've always is. been amused about with Rust is the weird reality we live in where Rust is being used to make faster JavaScript compilers and TypeScript compilers, despite Rust's compiler being one of the slowest in the entire industry. It's actually hilarious how long it takes for Rust code to build. I am regularly blown away by the speed that you don't get when you're compiling Rust code. Thankfully, it is, it, it, it is funny. That which makes things fast is inherently slow. There is something that's very beautiful about that. It competes with Haskell compiler. It does. It, it really does compete with the Haskell compiler. It is. It, I, do, I do love that. I, I love that fact. Both Go and Rust are being used to rethink how we build our JavaScript and TypeScript code. But I do think Rust needs to take some time to reflect on how they could speed things up on their side. The response. I don't think they can really. I mean, obviously, the compilation is extremely complex. Um, I, I'm sure there's like it, there's like base improvements they could do if they have any non-parallel stuff. But they talked about that, how they made parallel building of certain things much, much faster, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, yeah we, we all get those things. But one thing that I think is missing from here, uh, which is uh, uh, what's it called, it, which I guess you could c claim is right here is going to be ecosystem, like uh, uh, developer uh, tools, right? Developer tools. Um, one thing, like if you've never been on a million line code base with TypeScript, uh, effectively the LSP is 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 dog water. It doesn't run. It, it, it will run. You will get results five to send, 10 seconds later after you press the dot. Um, it's, it's, it's just really, really slow. It can't, it can't handle any sort of sizable real projects. It, it's just, it's absolutely terrible. And I work on a multi-million line code base with TypeScript and it just crumbles. It absolutely crumbles. And so that, that, that's like a real thing is that scaling dev tools is very interesting, kind of like, I guess, vertical within this developer velocity. When you start with Go or Rust, you literally use Go or Rust to do everything. Oh, cargo, you know, cargo add Tokyo, go get whatever, right? It's just like, it just works.
right? It just simply works. You want to go build, you want to go test, you want to go do anything. It's all within Go, and you don't have to do any of this extra crap. Whereas like with your TypeScript, if you happen to have made a TypeScript project two years ago, the likelihood that you're using Jest and not Vitest is through the roof. If you have a bunch of really complicated uh, complicated reporting mechanisms and async stuff inside your test, the chance of you using one tooling versus another is really, really high. Whereas Go, like that's not an option. You just don't, you don't even have that as like a thought process, right? The tooling already is good. And so you don't have to make these, a bunch of these like little, little ideas uh, or these little takes throughout your project. And there's a lot of starter projects that are really great to get started in TypeScript. Like you can get started today faster than you've ever been able to get started with something that builds really fast and it's actually very impressive. But the 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 other side is that the moment you scale beyond the basic tools needs, you you effectively inherit a build team. And if you don't believe me, please, for the love of all things holy and good, Go to any team with a large JavaScript project with a lot of internal tools and a lot of stuff they have to do and just see what they have to do to get the build to work the way they want it to work. Like, please, if you don't understand that, you just haven't done a real project yet. I'm not trying to, like, dunk on you. This is not me dunking on you. You just haven't done a real one yet that requires actual integration with proprietary stuff, and it becomes a nightmare, right? It is, it is very, very difficult, educational dunking stream it is an educational dunky stream uh, you know it's really really fun and so that's like where i think and i think rust suffers from this as well a little bit and i think go has the least suffering from it all shut up Boss, this was hurts. surprisingly positive low level even points out that the rust compile time issue is a very interesting and deep rabbit hole let me yeah. know if you want a whole video on that so i can low level him learning to help is figure awesome. it out everyone's saying developer velocity is extremely subjective yeah, yeah so is runtime and compilation time like a really good typescript dev could write something more efficient than a really bad rust dev but i'm talking about general it'd be hard to do that though that i think that's the take is that it's actually hard to write something in rust that is slower than ts it's it's actually hard to do like you'd, I, I, I'm not even sure exactly how bad you'd have to be to do that. It'd be impossible. It's not an, an impossibly hard. It, you just have to use a lot of clones. Like you just have to clone everything, and it would you effectively you just need a really large string. If you deal with a really large string, then you could do that. Incremental compile a compilation with proper structure of split crates uh, can be pretty fast. Yeah, it's decently fast. You can get it. Uh, you can get compilation time of Rust down to a few seconds. But you have to be really good to make it bad. World trends and extremes here. That's it. So if Go is right in the middle of the road or better than all of these other options, why am I not using it? Well, let's take a step back and go to when I first started trying out Go. When I joined Twitch in 2017, I was on the only team working in Elixir. It was really cool. Go ahead, Shy Ryan. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Brazilians. Just say it. Just say it. Just say it. Just let's go. Come on. Get it out of you guys. Shy Ryan right now is 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 doing the Brazilian Brazil just mentioned dance, but with with elixir. Hell yeah, Brazil mentioned. Let's go. Let's go, Jose Valum. We're able to move super fast and build crazy stuff. The only reason our little two and a half engineering team could build the infrastructure for all of Twitch's marathon content was what elixir in the Erlang VM. I love Bob Ross. I cannot tell you how often I'll just put him on in the background. Just to just to enjoy a little bit of, you know, Bob Ross in the background. The thing is, is I hope to never find out about his personal life because I always worry. You know, have you ever had this worry that you find out that Bob, like, you find out that the person you think is really, really nice turns out to be a complete asshole in the background? I really don't think he's that way, okay? But just imagine if you found out that he was just, like, horrifying. Uh, it would just hurt me because then, you know, I'd be watching and be like, man, but he's like really a bad guy in the background. But he seems like a really nice guy. He seems like a really nice guy. And the stories I have heard are all positive. Ah, oh, love Bob Ross. I love Bob Ross. Yeah, it would hurt me again. Yeah. I mean, it, this happens. Enabled. He was a drill sergeant. I was able to level yeah. up significantly as a dev, get deep into functional programming, and move faster than it ever moved before by working in Elixir with that team. Sadly, that team ultimately folded, and I ended up on a team working on the video infrastructure for the rest of Twitch, which was all in on Go. At the time, I hated front end. I was known as the anti JavaScript guy. I hated the web. I didn't like building for browsers. I shot on Electron all the time. So most Good move, by the way. Uh, I actually am curious because there's something that I've been wanting to do, which is 
I want to like I want to catalog all of my opinions that have changed over the last ten years. You know, it's kind of interesting. Like even Theo just mentioning the things that he has changed on. Isn't it funny? Like, isn't it funny how the world changes and and what you think is terrible can uh will you know will will change over time. It's 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 totally normal, but it's kind of fun to kind of catalog and think about how you viewed the world. Like, okay, real talk. I'm gonna be I'm gonna be dead serious here and. Maybe I still think it's true. I think Grunt was one of the better build tools for JavaScript. Gulp is better. I hear you. Gulp is better. Gulp did not come around. Grunt walked so Gulp could run, so Webpack could make your life miserable. Okay? That's how I look at things. And so when I used what the hell is Grunt, yeah, you just that's because you didn't understand. You weren't there. Tweet? That is a, that is a tweet. I would say that, that that is a tweet. That's a tweet. Mostly focused on building native apps and backends. I'd done a lot of time in both Android and iOS development, but really was focused on servers. So moving to Go seemed to be the right move. And it wasn't. I was miserable. Every second I spent in that language, I hated. And I gave it a solid two months. And it wasn't because the language is this horrible, terribly designed thing, although we'll get to I'm some curious. of the design quirks in a bit. It just didn't make me feel smart. And I get it. I under He's ready for rest. No, I mean, this is real. This is real. Some some people find joy in that. I, I don't want to I don't want to dunk on him because I know a lot of people that want to feel smart while they program. I don't I don't I mean, I, I really don't think at my age, I'm older now. OK, Theo's a, Theo's a younger fellow than me by about a decade. And at this point in my life, I don't want to feel smart like I don't. I have no I have no desire to feel smart. I want to be as stupid as possible every single time like you know what i like doing here's kind of like the kind of the real talk well you're doing a great job of that Brian. hey thanks thanks teach like uh teach all you can always count on teach to make you feel a certain way you know like I'm, I'm not gonna lie to you uh this is a hard problem creating like an extensible tcp um protocol to be able to send packets back and forth between uh golang and vim and to actually have like a real extensible way to be able to create sessions and all that. That is a complex problem, but I want to solve it in the simplest possible way. So that way, I like to solve problems that make me feel smart in a language that doesn't make me feel smart. Does that make sense? I like that. To me, that's, that's where I feel really good at, is I like to solve the hard problem. Oh, we have Ginger Bill? Oh, hell yeah, what's Ginger Bill have to say? Ginger Bill, by the way, Odin creator definitely smarter than me. Okay, I mean, it's not that hard to be smarter than me, by the way. It's really not that hard. Uh, user Ginger, what do you, what did you have to say, Ginger? By the way, uh, Ginger Bill, we got to get you on here. Uh, I, I actually do want to get you on here for a talk at some point. The problem is, the problem I always have with wanting to feel smart is that I pretty much always make really dumb decisions. Feeling smart does not equal being smart. Feeling smart equals acting dumb. You think so? That's that, it's a little bit of a hot take. I like it. I like it though, Ginger. I like it though. I think it's good. Uh, I, hey, can we all take one second and applaud Theo for being honest though? There's a lot of you out here right now. There's a lot of you out here right now that completely agree with Theo and you're and you're just not being honest about it. That's why I call it type masturbation, right? I'm being real on that one. People like type masturbation. They like the act of creating a very complex type so they can have the world's greatest everything because they just they they just do something they they just want to feel anything in life. You know what I mean? Everybody loves type masturbation. Type masturbation. Say what clitoris. You just hold on now. Um it's real though. People like they people people genuinely like that. DHH was right about types, maybe understand that programming is not about feeling clever and smart all the time. In fact, the desire to feel clever regularly results in really bad code being written. I'm certainly guilty Good of take. that myself, but Good Go take. never sparked joy for me. And I miss that because when I was in Elixir, I actually was loving it. I was So I actually have to put a big time out right now. This is something that I think Theo should think about. Theo, you know, I'm going to talk to you one-on-one -on, -one on this one. You have made fun of DHH quite a bit about his dislike of TypeScript. And the reason why he doesn't like TypeScript is that it doesn't spark joy. Like, we're talking about, I, I think, potentially even the identical phrase being used. 
And so I, I do think you gotta, you know, you know what I mean? Let's let's apply that. Let's let's give let's give some man let's give a man some grace if he has the same argument why he doesn't like TypeScript. Hey, that's his, you know, that's his that's his prerogative. We're not this is not this is not a bully theo. It's it's actually it's I think it's actually kind of a funny observation because I never heard him say the term spark joy. And like I totally get that. Really, at the end of the day, you just hope that you can provide a nice life for yourself and the people that you love. Uh, that you can have uh, stability of some sort, that you can uh, just enjoy the things out of life while being able to solve problems that kind of bring you kind of bring you life. And, you know, the reality is that if you're solving really hard problems, but you're just not liking it at all and you'd rather solve simple problems, it doesn't matter how cool your job is. You're going to have a you're, you're going to lose a lot of joy and you're going to feel a lot of like upsetness in your heart. And it's going to it's going to kind of pull at you over and over and over again. And eventually you're going to have burnout. And so, like, I don't mind this take. I actually think this take is perfectly fine. If Go just doesn't spark joy and you just don't want to do it and you find yourself lamenting every time you use it, I think that's, like, a perfectly valid reason to say I don't want to use it. Because you know what's worse than uh, – you know what's worse than writing in a language that I think is utterly t- doo-doo is writing in a language that, m- that makes you have burnout. Like, TypeScript doesn't make me have burnout. I just, I just think that people write complex code in TypeScript all the time. My work doesn't spark joy, so I'm not going to go anymore. Uh, do you know what sparks joy for me? T- uh, tuning into your streams. Ah, ah, baby. Right? Like, I can write TypeScript and not have burnout. Like, I, I think it's fun language. I just think that it's it gets really complicated really quick, and I don't like building large applications in it because it always just gets all stupid. Um, I don't know if I, I – C++ doesn't spark joy in me. You know what I mean? C++ is one of the very few languages that I actually get really sad when I have to write. And I've had to write it maybe for 400 hours at at Netflix. It just doesn't make me. It just doesn't make me happy. You know what I mean? I don't like reading C++ code. I don't like writing C++ code. I just don't like it. C, on the other hand, I think C is kind of fun. C is kind of this like I've had to write some C. I had to write a dri- I had to like co-write a driver. I was definitely on the the lesser side of the writing. I was like 40 percent of writing the driver for one of our internal test devices for uh for live video. And that took a that that was fun. I was writing C, writing also drivers. I totally effed up the audio buffer like five times. It was a lot of fun. It was a ton of fun to be able to write those kind of things. And that was just a couple years ago. That was I I had a blast doing that. And so I love C. C is a good time. I wrote the entire uh, we we have a synthetic live video sync. So if you don't know what a sync is, that means as audio and all the video frames go in, it's sent into the decoder, which the decoder is going to be like your TV, right? It's going to be, now we are handing it off to the TV. I wrote a virtual version of that, that takes everything in and reports kind of like the stats about it. And it's all written in C. I really enjoyed that. That was a great process. I even wrote a bunch of unit tests for it. It was a lot of fun. I, I, I completely enjoy that process. C++ just makes me sad. Right, and there's not. It's not like you can't write C when you're using C plus plus. It just makes me sad. I don't know why. So I get this. This is a great argument, and I think this argument you got to extend grace to other people for for doing that. Right. For the first time in my career, Java doesn't make me sad. I I don't mind Java. I don't mind most. I honestly don't mind most languages. There's very few languages that make me sad. Genuinely enjoying the craft of building and creating software, and then I went to Go. And that just wasn't a thing anymore, which was by design. Because Go was designed to be boring and minimal, repetitive and consistent. I'll never forget the way Go was described to me by one of my first managers at Twitch. One of the specific goals of Go was that if you took two PRs, one from a really senior dev who'd been working in Go for half a decade, and one from a newer dev that just recently learned Go, the code would look nearly identical, which was a very strange way of thinking to me. I had never worked in a language that... By the way, that is like, that's, I really like that. Like, to me, that's very exciting. Um, That's a huge W in my book because that means maintainability is big. Well, that's not an L take. He just said that it surprised him, right? Have you ever, like, if you've never thought about that once, if you use JavaScript, you could get, like, I, I make this argument about Rust all the time, which is if you got five senior Rust engineers into a room and told them all to solve, like, a, a decent-sized problem, maybe one that took a 1,000 lines, you'd have... None of the solutions look like each other. There all would be unique, flowery way to do things. If you did that with JavaScript, you could have the exact same experience. You did that with Go, though, they're going to be all fairly similar. And that's like a, for me, that's a big selling point because at the end of the day, I like the idea of being able to maintain stuff, right? Because, because you know, remember, we don't ship features. 
As programmers, we don't ship features. We ship maintenance to our future self. Don't forget that. It's a fact of life. Can you elaborate? What would you like me to elaborate on? You ship stuff that you will have to maintain tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day. That had that We're going to go on. Making things as simple, focused in one way as possible. And then there was the garbage collector, which was a very interesting addition for a lower level language because most of those languages had you manage your memory yourself. Usually garbage collectors were associated with languages that were much higher level, often running in their own runtimes or virtual machines like Java. So Go, feeling like C++, but not making memory your problem. Feels like C, but yes. Was a weird mental shift that has enabled a lot of wins, but also a lot of confusion. The result's a language that doesn't necessarily fit in any one specific box. And as a result, it's been hard for me to recommend for a long time. But the more I think about it and look at it and break down the decisions that were made in its design, I have started to see the strengths, especially now that I've seen many a project try and fail to rewrite itself in Rust. A lot of my frustrations with Go are very well detailed. By the way, I do uh, absolutely love this idea of people failing to rewrite stuff. It's funny to me. Because it is hard. Like people don't realize like how hard it is to be good at when you're good at Go, it makes you feel like you're good at programming. And then you use other languages that are a touch harder and you realize like how hard it really is to use, say, Rust. Like you really have to study Rust. You really have to like be deep down. Zig, on the other hand, I think Zig may have. You know how hard it really is? Oh. Um, I think Zig is actually one of the more interesting ones because I'm actually curious if Zig has a fairly similar learning curve and experience as Go, just with a slight bit more deepness to it. Uh, like like maybe a little bit more learning curve. Zig uh, feels verbose at first look, but so does, jo uh, so does Go, right? So does Go. Uh, I have this kind of like, this is the easiest way to understand languages, okay? So... Effectively, just imagine you have this pyramid right here. And at the very tippity top, this is you're going to have your compiled memory managed language. So you're going to have C, Zig, uh, C++, Rust, right? You have all those ones. The next layer is going to be Go. Pretty much Go and OCaml are the ones that I know of uh, off the top of my head. They're going to be compiled languages that go down into the machines, but they're going to be garbage collected. So they are... They're just a little bit different, right? They, they're, they're closer to the top of the triangle than they are the bottom of the triangle. The next one's going to be like your C-sharps or your Java, right? These ones are a little bit different, right? Because they are, they are garbage collected, but they aren't necessarily compiled into machine code. They have like, you know, they got some, some sort of virtualness to them. Maybe C-sharp doesn't have that anymore. Maybe C-sharp, you can straight up compile it down to a static binary. I have no idea what C-sharp does anymore these days. C-sharp has greatly changed since I used it, but typically they produce a bytecode in which is interpreted and eventually jitted and all that kind of stuff. So C-sharp maybe exists like right here. Maybe it's better to say C-sharp exists right here. I don't want to say whether or not. And then you have your like more of the bottom of the barrel, which is going to be your JavaScript, uh, which is going to be uh, your Python. And then you have the actual bottom, which is going to be Ruby, right? You know what I mean? There we go. Lua, Lua would fall under this one right here uh, because Lua has Lua JIT. So there you go. That's kind of how I look at languages. And so typically this part of the triangle is really easy to master and be good at. This part of the triangle tends to be really hard to master and be good at. But Zig might be unique in this situation that Zig may be easier to master and be good at while maintaining all of the amazingness of managed memory and uh, managed memory and compiled. Just a thought. Just a thought. Just a thought I've been having. Just a thought, you know, the old brain has been thinking about by faster than lime in his odin i don't the problem is, is i don't know odin enough to have us like i don't know it enough to know how good it is but odin definitely is going to be if i'm not mistaken odin you ma manage your own memory and all that so odin would fall into here and odin may be on the same level of zig as in next generation language that's super like that it has all the the goodness right here without all the difficulty right same with Jai. Yeah, Jai could be it as well. But again, no idea. We haven't done the planet scale stuff. Two blog posts about it. His two blog posts are titled, I want to get off Mr. Golang's wild ride and lies we tell ourselves to keep using Golang. Both of these are great articles. I highly recommend reading. I didn't like the articles. Them if you can. 
like get off goes wild ride one of them was just the fact that uh file system strings aren't utf-8 and go forces you to use utf-8 so there could exist a file in which uses a non-utf-8 character in which you could like try to read i just i would say that if you if you don't use a utf-8 character in your in your file name you're you're just a bad person okay they changed my perspective on the language and more importantly made me feel way less gaslit because i hated my time in go and didn't have great words for why two of my favorite points in here are around types and channels i absolutely love this quote this quote came from ozcon which was a conference for programming language i do agree that i wish channels were slightly better i really think they should make channels too that just have a bit better semantics around them uh especially on like are they closed all that kind of stuff. I'd love to see a, a, a slightly better thing around it because I know channels can be a bit difficult sometimes. Language nerds and designers. And at the time, Lion was working on designing his own language. And as he said here, he gave a bad presentation, but he fondly remembers when an audience member asked the Go team, why did you choose to ignore any research about type systems since the 1970s? I didn't fully understand the implications at the time, but I sure do now. Go's types are utter chaos. And I don't think they're utter chaos. I actually think they're very, they're, they make you step back and stop trying to be clever. I think there's a huge amount of clever that involves there. I, I'm not convinced that this is bad. I am, I'm honestly not convinced that uh, using something beyond the 1970s is bad. Okay, I still use Vim. So to be completely fair, I'm out, I'm out, I'm out here still using the 70s. Default nil is yuck. I, I'm on that team. I think that that's a failure. That's a failure of their types and all that. Do I wish they had options? I think they would have been better to use options versus uh, nil, 100%. But you got to also remember that when you use options, anytime you use that kind of concept, you also have to add in a bunch of guards. And those guards can be very annoying, right? Like if you have a pointer and you know it will always not be nil, well, you know, I'm sorry. That's not not in the option world that you're going to have to it could be it could be theoretically, therefore you got to option it, right? And so I think that it is it's not a it's not a simple conversation to have. It just makes a lot more stuff, you know what I mean? Uh if error does not equal nil, nil is annoying too. I actually completely disagree with that take. You know what I think is more annoying than if error does not equal nil? calling functions that will error and you don't know to me that is that is a 10x awfulness you know what also is really awful uh what is what i think is one of the worst aspects of programming is the following is that i could have a function right so i pretend i'm in javascript i'm in lua right now so just pretend i'm in javascript and i have a bunch of lines and then i have a try because you know i, I mean i just have to and a catch and now I have to make a decision here how to handle my error versus which one of these lines failed, to what state have we got to, when uh, when and how do I make that decision? If you don't do that, then what do you have to do? Well, you have to do this like really annoying thing, right? Which that totally sucks. Like nobody wants to do, you know, let foo this and then you do this whole foo equals that. Like nobody wants to do any of that. You know what I mean? Like that, that also super duper 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 sucks. And so it's like... Do I mind if error equals nil? Is it like too much? Yeah, I agree. It's annoying. But the other way is also super annoying. You know what I mean? The other way is also super duper annoying. Anyways, let's keep on going. The result is rough. I personally, in the tiny bit of Go I had in production at Twitch, introduced a pretty significant number of bugs. And the reason is a lot of values were nullable, but the type system just couldn't detect that. So yeah but you call that just skill issues right you, you got to know those things it's not i'm not saying it's good like i actually i mean i'm i'm like 60 percent on theo's team i wish the zero values were better like i think one of Go's biggest mistakes is that maps are nils to begin with but it's also a skill issue right like i i also just need to learn that right i mean to be completely fair be completely fair when i go in here and i go const a equals sum array one to uh 69 and then up oh, that's sorted dang it a dot push four right and then i go sort and i go const b equals uh a dot sort uh and then oh, dang it i have to do this whole a b uh, oh wow how did you know that you know like well, you would mess this up in production, right? Notice that I've already like notice that I've already done the exact same skill issue as a map is nil is that I already know 
that this thing will sort incorrectly, potentially due to it treating things like strings, right? Like I already know these things. It's, a, it's one of these many programming language little rules you have to keep in your head. And when I do that, I'm like, oh, look, B came out and it got sorted. Awesome. I know that it's sort, but what you don't realize is that it also sorted in place. Like you would only know that if you've shot yourself in the foot. Bam, right? You shot yourself in the foot once and now you know, and now you're not going to make that mistake again, right? And so it's the same thing with map and nils, right? You, you make that mistake and then boom. Does that make sense? And so it's like, that's why I have such a, I have a problem with those kind of takes, but I also don't because he is 100% correct. I think the language should have done a much better job at warning you. I really do believe that. Long sock enjoyer? Yeah, I'm a long sock enjoyer. Like, I really do, I, I really think that the language should do a better job at warning you, but I also don't necessarily hold it too much against him, like, or against the language. There were multiple instances sense. where I thought a value existed. I did something with it, but it didn't, so it failed. And there was nothing to hold your hand through that type of stuff. They handle errors great, but they don't handle empty great unless you choose to make empty an error case in which... By the way, fair take. That's an extremely fair take. It is a fair take. I think everybody here can agree. I would much like... I think we all want options. We just don't want the verbosity of options. <sighs> It's tough, right? It's tough. Like, I think that's one thing that does, uh, that TypeScript does pretty good in the sense that TypeScript, when you do, when you have a, 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 an undefinable value or a nullable value, when you check to see if it's nullable and then you return, the next line will now know that that value is not nil and therefore you will get it. Pattern matching uh, needn't be uh, to be verbose. Uh, pattern matching still makes it verbose. I mean, no matter how you skin the cat, Options make more verbose code every single time because you have to have some level of, of lifting. So the answer is in the linting. I mean, I think, I think that that's actually really nice. Lithium, I, I truly do think that that's a really nice way to do, to do stuff. Optional chain, but at the end of the day, you still have to do some sort of lifting operation. You, can, you, can, you can't just have one monad. Oh, you never have a love. Yeah, lifting is greater than if. If statements are lifting though, right? Like if you're in Rust and you do... Uh, if you do if, you know, uh, let some X, you know, you're still lifting. I just lifted, right? It's just like, that's not, you know what I mean? Like that, you still have to do that, right? And that that's the thing that I'm talking about when I say that, um, when I say that options are verbose, is that you have to, if you want the value underneath it, you have to do something, right? Sure, you can x dot and then, right? You can do x dot map, right? But you still have to do a thing to get to the value. In TypeScript, you still have to if, you know, if, if foo, if, if not, if not foo bar, then return false or whatever it is, right? You still have to do something, right? That's what I mean by that. We need operators for options. Yeah, I mean, Rust Rust actually has a pretty good one, which Rust does have the whole function foo. And if you return out an option, right, whatever that option is, you can then do something that looks like, sorry, my indenting is all wrong. I'm in a Lua file, so just, just deal with it. If I had a, a, a other func and this thing returned an option, I could just throw on that. I actually think that this is one of the better, I actually think this is one of the better things about Rust. I think Rust did a really good job with that. I think that this is something that, makes options not nearly as crappy, but it also makes it so that there's only one way to handle it, which is you have to just return. Prime successfully uh, ignored everybody mentioning Kotlin. Yeah, I did. Kotlin, these nuts, right? Dealing with it currently in jail. OCaml. I'm sure OCaml has a nice way to do it. Uh, Ginger Bill, here, here's a quick question. Ginger Bill, with, um, hey, I saw you just chatting. Ginger, are, how does Odin have... Uh, options or how do you handle the the bottom values nil undefined you have maybe t okay okay do you i mean do you have the same unwrapping do you do pattern match to unwrap it do you do like a just an if check and then afterwards you know that it's not nil then from there on out it's defined like typescript like what's the way that you use unwrap the burrito boys <laughs> that's why monads are burritos okay so you do this okay so say, same way as like a standard rust one or even Okay, cool. Yeah. I like this, by the way. This is very go -y. I do like. I do like this, by the way. This is very nice. This is very nice. Uh, it's almost... It's a Zig. I think Zig does something similar. I think Zig does something along the lines of X uh, value, like something like that. Right? I think... 
I think X has a or a Zig has a very similar thing. I'm I'm fine with those kind of that kind of stuff. Uh, I think that yours is a little bit better in the sense that you could I assume you can chain off of it, and I think chaining is pretty cool. X or return. Oh, that's really cool. I like that. That's 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 pretty legitimate. I do like the fact that it's X or return. That's cool because you're kind of giving that option right there. I like that. Okay. Odin might be the best language. Damn it. Odin might be pretty dang cool. Ah, uh, dang it. I don't want to learn another language, Ginger Bell. I love it, though. Love it. But I do agree. I, I Case, genuinely agree with have fun. It's crazy how they got one side so right and the other so wrong. And that jarring experience felt weird because I felt at the time like I was constantly checking errors because the type system couldn't prevent them. I've since learned there's a balance here where there are errors that no type system can prevent and having a system that encourages you to handle those errors is good. But having a type system to prevent that is also good. And they entirely yeah. failed to strike that balance and go. The other part I hear a lot about is channels. Because channels are regularly pitched to me as the reason to use Go. If you're doing concurrent things, Go is one of the best languages for it. No, it's not. The channel axioms make no sense. If you're not familiar with channels, they're the core model for concurrency in Go. And they have some weird quirks. These are the four channel axioms. Ascend to a nil channel blocks forever. A receive from a nil channel blocks forever. Ascend to a closed channel panics. And a receive from a closed channel returns the zero value immediately. None of these behaviors make any sense. And I've had a lot of people try to explain them. I do agree. Like I said. I, 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 I do agree with this point that I think channels, that's why I said earlier, I want to see a V2. But also, Go is by far more significantly better at handling async uh, than, than most languages. Like, it is probably the best. I haven't used Elixir enough to know that it's not. But I think that Go right now is the best. Kotlin is better. Go, I don't know if that's true. I don't know, because people say a lot of things about Kotlin uh elixir is really good it's the v okay oh really okay yeah so that's that's like that's the thing like obviously this ascend to a closed channel panics forever is interesting i'd you know again this is why i'd say a better better close like better go semantics i think would be nicer nonsense sending to a nil channel should error receiving from a nil channel should error sending to a closed channel should error or i guess panic fine that's the closest to a reasonable one uh pan i mean panic kind of sucks i'd rather see an error i'd honestly rather see an error honestly but rather than it really really sending to a nil channel should panic because you're doing a nil access a receive from a nil channel should nil because or should do a panic because it, it's a nil access a send to a closed channel i'd rather see an error and a receive from a closed channel i'd rather see an error right i'd rather see two values come out of a channel right value and error right i'd rather see that panic why don't you just return an error that's Nail is go's gone. whole yep. thing is returning errors all over the a panic is like uh an unrecoverable error generally an unrecoverable error is the best way to put it it's like where your system effectively has done something in which is unrecoverable now in typescript you can uh, it's not unrecover i know but it's gen generally to say it's unrecoverable it doesn't stink you do it all the time panic is a crash P panic is it's good that it's a crash in the sense that when you've done something so stupid and something so far out, it's good. Panics are not easily recoverable in Go. That's crazy talk, okay? That is crazy talk because you have to know about, you have to understand the state in which you are recovering from. Panics are not, I mean, it's the same, it's the same thing about like deep try catches, unhandled exceptions. How do you, how, what do you do? Real talk. How do you recover from an unhandled exception? I don't know what. What do you do? How do you re how do you recover the state? Should you keep moving forward? Is your database going to be fine? You ignore it. You break the system crash. I would prefer the dump and say this is where it happened and let's like let's go from there, right? It's it's it is you recover from Stack Overflow, right? <laughs> That's what I'm saying is that recovering from a panic is hard. Because it's different than recovering from an error. Because an error is like, oh, I can see why this thing failed. Therefore, I'm going to do this. Process. Yeah, now I understand there's process dot unhandled exception. And you forgot, by the way, uh, uh, Metlex, I can tell that you're not there because there's also unhandled rejection. Okay, you forgot your little promise there, buddy. But nonetheless, it doesn't make it easy because you have to figure out how do you recover from a completely orthogonal point. Uh, checks for the closed channel. 
So if you have two variables, it, it works better. So I have a quick question about that because this one's saying if you try to receive from a nil channel, it blocks forever, right? This one's saying, oh, this is for a closed channel. So then that, okay, so if you if you try to receive from a closed channel, you get the okay, you get the second variable, and then you know it's closed. Okay, so this fourth one, this fourth one's not real. Let's just say this fourth one is not real. And that's fine. But the other three are still real. I think that, like I said, I'd love to see a channels V2 that has all the same syntax as a channel and is it is mostly swappable with a channel other than like a couple of these. You know what I mean? I'd love to see that. Place and receive returns the zero value immediately. So there's no way when I receive from a channel to detect if it's closed or not. What? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. No, this isn't a mess. And as But Theo just didn't know that and neither did Faster Than Lime obviously didn't put that in there so that people that are reading this have a worse take than is available. Uh, so you can, obviously, as someone just said, you can, right? So, you know. As Lime says here, the reason is there had to be a meaning for nil channels, so they picked these ones. Yeah, chaos. There was recently a presentation about the things that Go did right and wrong, and thankfully, they acknowledged the failure of their type definitions here. We define generic containers in the language proper, maps, slices, arrays, and channels, without giving programmers access to the genericity that they contained. This was arguably yep. a mistake. We believed, correctly I still think, that most simple programming tasks could be handled just fine with those types, but there are Correct. some that cannot, and the barrier between what the language provided and what the user could control definitely bothers some people. More that's true. And now they have generics. And so you can get most, you can get 90% of what, like at this point, there's almost nothing that Go can do, like, isn't pretty dang good. Because there even is right now, there's like a slices, there's now a slices package, which you can do generic operations over arrays. So it is, we're pretty dang, it's pretty dang close. Than bothered and more than some. I'm sure this has caused plenty of issues in the past. I know I certainly encountered plenty myself. Regardless, Lime did a great job of explaining my frustrations with Go. So why are we talking about it today? Why Why do I care? Let's diagram this one out because it's hard to just put in words. Yeah. If you're familiar with the line of prime, this is likely going to feel somewhat familiar. On one side of this spectrum, we will say perf rules all. And the other side will say dev velocity. I'll just say perf here. This is a rough spectrum. I can already tell I'm going to fundamentally disagree because I think often people measure dev velocity based on familiarity. And I also think that any large, larger long ran TypeScript project features grind to a halt. When I say large, I mean large. Not, not, we're not talking 50,000 lines of code. Okay, that, that, that's not large. Where on the left here, ultimate performance is key and focus. And on the right side, dev velocity is the focus. So let's make some rectangles. We'll say there's an obvious thing that fits here. Let's say it with me, guys. C++, ultimate performance. Good luck with the developer velocity. Where on the other side, we have JS and TypeScript and things like that, where the performance will not be as good, but you get really fast developer velocity. You could also put that. things like Great. Python here. I'd argue Python's theoretically capable of being a little faster, and I would argue roughly the same velocity. Python's actually definitely slower than JavaScript in Python proper, but in Python bindings to C, Python is faster, right? That's why you get something like NumPy. It's, you can go pretty quick. So yeah, it's slower than V8 in Python peer, but it's faster than V8 because most of the things you do is in um, C land, right? That you can get from JavaScript and TypeScript. And as you see here, just because something covers more area than other options, that doesn't mean I necessarily recommend it. Like if Python can be faster than JavaScript and TypeScript, why would I ever use JS and TS? Because I have to, it's necessary on the client. And also it has a really good tool set and ecosystem. It makes a lot of sense to use JavaScript and TypeScript where you can, because there are places where you need to. What we're starting to see is a gap forming in the middle here. And if we were to start plugging it, we can only get so far with something like Rust. Rust theoretically can't be quite as fast as C++ unless you break a lot of its rules. C++ lets you write theoretically faster code, but it also is harder to write correctly and is more error prone. It's actually a fair take. It's, it is easy to write shared memory operations in C++, but shared memory operations, man, like, I mean, that's, it's pretty, it's pretty crappy. It's, it's not a, it's like, that's not, you're not, uh, you're not loving life when you're doing that. Okay. You're not loving life. Uh, whereas Rust, you can do that, but it's, it makes a lot of these stuff near shared memory or even like it makes partition shared memory really easy to do. And so one thing that you can do is like, you can actually do a, you can actually take like say an array buffer 
and you can actually slice out a bunch of contiguous regions and all of those individual can be mutable references. And so like that, that is true. Like you can actually split up contiguous shared memory and have multi threat. Like you can have some pretty good access into it, changing things without, you know, without all the complications of C++. You can go pretty good with the concurrency side, but nonetheless, when you get to that last final part, it's very, very difficult. There's almost a separate it's axis Arch here Texas that everywhere. I'm not going to be the one to make. And if somebody wants to make an updated version of this diagram that has an axis. Data, parallel, data parallelism is easier in Rust. Facts. 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 Logic of life. C++ is uh, most of the time skill issues. The problem is that the, to earn the ability to not have those skill issues requires you also to do it for 25 years. I was just playing with shared memory in JS the other day. Yeah, you can do that, but you're not really, it's not really shared memory. Unless if you're doing workers and a shared buffer, then I think you can get there. And I'm not really sure. I have never played with uh, shared memory buffers in JavaScript with workers. Can you can you can you edit them at the exact same time? Because that's like that's the like that would be the win. If you can edit them at the exact same time, then you could actually get some pretty fast speed. But you also have no synchronous logic that's available. You'd have no ability to say, hey, I need to own this region for some amount of time before anybody else. You have no lock. You have no mutex. You have no semaphores. And that's where the things get real. I mean, that's that's always the problem. What's that semaphore? Well, it's to prevent you from dying. Of reliability. Go nuts. You have my support. But that's not what I'm here to talk about today. What I'm here to talk about is this giant gap in the middle here. This gap exists with a lot of the tools and technologies we talk about. I've always referred to it as the uncanny valley. And I think that's the case here more than ever. If we draw lines for this space here, uncanny valley. This is an area. By the way, I, I hate Excalidraw, how they try to make the handwriting like it's handwriting and having this slight inconsistency like that little thing right there. It's so evenly inconsistent. It like, it bothers me. I hate even, I hate consistent inconsistency because it's not real. Uh, where the tooling isn't going to be I know I can disable that. I have it disabled, but I'm just saying the, the fact that like, you know, you have like the, the open mouth here, you have the open mouth here. It's just like, it's like, it's like, it's, it, perfect for you know anyone I mean? because it doesn't lean far enough in one direction. TypeScript and JavaScript will always have a crazy it's ecosystem reinventing how we build so that we can move faster and do really cool stuff. And that's great for people who are in greenfield projects. And Rust will always move a little bit slower and be tolerant of things like terrible compile times because their goal is performance and safety above all else. As a result, these things are very exciting and enticing because they represent extremes. And those extremes get us extremely either excited or disgruntled. And this is why those technologies get the clicks, the reach, the stars, and all the hype that they get, because they represent extremes of mindsets and extremes of needs that developers have. But there are things that live in this middle ground. And I would, you know what I'd love to see? I would love to see somebody who has never, ever programmed before. Like if, if only I could have like a, a real experiment here where I could have a hundred devs who've never programmed before, like a, a, to be devs. And a hundred of them go and learn Go, and a hundred of them go and learn JavaScript and see where they get in one month. Like that's, that's the real dev velocity that you want to measure. Again, I think one of the problems that you're seeing is that you're measuring this from a position of understanding. Do you know what I mean? Like you're measuring it from a position that you already have a bunch of this pre-built-in knowledge that makes it feel like what you're good at is easy to use. Have you ever have you ever talked with someone that thinks C++ is super easy? And yet, oh, I have. I know some people. I have some people on my team that have been doing nothing but C++ for 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 literally 30 plus years and they're like, "Oh, it's actually really easy. You just have to do all these things." And for them, it's like completely straightforward. But for me, it's not straightforward. It feels difficult. And so what ends up happening? You think something is easier than it actually is. And so that's generally how I view all graphs when it comes to dev velocity is that I think we're all wrong. I think that I'm wrong. Okay. I think I'm wrong on what is actually easy and not easy. I think Theo's wrong on what's easy and not easy. I think this is really just a, this is, this is better to look at. I think it's probably better to have this graph as perf matters to what I am most familiar with matters. That's probably a better way to put this graph because I would have something probably slightly different here. Honestly, if I were to build something, I could easily build it in TypeScript. 
I wouldn't be able to easily build it in Go as easy because I'm simply not as familiar with Go. I'm, remember, I'm only I'm really only in on on like three weeks of actually trying to learn Go. But I'm already like pretty close. Like my line would be like right here on TypeScript. It'd be like right there, and so I can already tell that I'm having my ability to learn it is extremely fast. Rust, on the other hand, I did it for two years for all my side projects plus a bunch of internal tools, and I was pretty dang fast at it. I'm pretty like comfortable in Rust, but I can tell you that there's definitely like this weird trow of not being fast or these moments of like sinking your dev velocity. And that's where things get very interesting with Go, or I mean with, uh, with Rust. Rust is something where you're making progress, you're making progress, you're making progress. You realize that one of your design decisions is actually not good, and your, your velocity just, just tanks because now you have to reconsider huge swaths of your program to get, it, to get it going and then to go back up and keep going faster. The trial is real. Like I think Rust generally is as fast to develop as TypeScript, but... If you goof it up just a little bit, you'd collapse. Is that not true for other languages as well? It's not nearly as true for other languages. Other languages have the ability to kind of uh, to put stuff over the top. What about the dev velocity when you move across boundaries of context and share code? Like when uh, your Rust program is no longer just doing that one thing and is now used by other Rust programs across teams. Yeah, that one's also interesting. So I haven't, I haven't got to that point. So I wouldn't know about that point yet. That's what I, I, I still don't know about that, but it is very interesting. Um, it is really interesting because I, I just, like I said, I only did it for, for pet projects slash for tools and tools are very like kind of one dimensional. And I, I even rewrote one of my Rust tools in TypeScript just to make it easier for other people to use, run, and be more comfortable with, you know, like I, I, I was willing to do that. There are things you could do to make these other technologies fit here. I know that people have hacked stuff like Java to fit in here with languages that are built on top, like Scala. I know people have tried to make Ruby run faster by porting its runtime to stuff like Java. None of these solutions really filled this middle out. Great. I think Java does fill this, like any of the Java stuff. If you're really good at Java, you can whip out a lot of services and you can do a really good job pretty easily. Like, I mean, most of Netflix backend is just Java. People can do it. That's like definitely an argument of familiarity. Um, Java Spring totally, totally can do it, and it's much faster than Java uh, JS or TypeScript. It, it can do quite a bit in my tr my language triangle. It is it is further up the triangle of performance, uh, and so it, it can most certainly do that. But th then again, you have to do Java, which a lot of people have a visceral reaction to hearing that they're doing Java. Kotlin, I assume, has the same thing. Uh, I'm sure Kotlin has fairly close similarities look uh, looked into it js has atomics for shared array buffers oh really uh, i've only just gotten to workers for a large project i'm beginning i'm currently in the play phase keeping it uh fun by applying the creative coding nice that's super cool that's super cool that they had i didn't realize that they had synchronous uh, uh yeah synchronization honestly if you're doing a big project like this and it doesn't have to be done it, it's not a ui i would just strongly consider looking at something like go like i think you'll find your life a, a lot easier having better uh, better concurrency semantics, better better parallelism and better concurrency semantics than than something like using everything. It's all web-based. Then if it's all web-based, have fun with JavaScript. <laughs> have fun with JavaScript. Great, though. And this is where things get interesting. This is the goal of Go, is to be this middle. And as of recent, they have pushed further this. I don't think that's the goal of Go. I honestly think the goal of Go was this to begin with. I think the goal of Go was to take people who are relatively inexperienced in larger uh, larger enterprise systems and to be able to make them as effective as possible. I think that the original design intent of Go was actually developer to velocity. If I'm not mistaken, if you go and, if you go and listen to um, Rob Pike, I'm pretty sure that's what he said. The goal of Go was to make people who don't know how to program to be as effective as possible. So I actually think it's, 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 this is go incidentally as fast because it was designed by smart people, right? I think that's, that's what it is. That's what I read. Yeah, yeah. Rob Pike was very, very certain on this. They failed, didn't they? I don't think they failed at all. I really don't think they failed. As someone who's writing their first real Go project, I'm loving, I'm loving it. I'm shocked. I'm shocked at how much I enjoy it way with the introduction of arenas in order to understand the importance of arenas you Fair. first need to understand our arenas I, th I, did, I thought arenas are still in um uh experimental mode i didn't i didn't realize that they have been officially uh they're gone they gone oh they they left them arenas are dead arenas are dead yeah i thought i thought i thought i remember reading something about that uh 
they left a lot on the table. That's fair. Uh, but arenas are very, very exciting. You know what I mean? I do like the idea of arenas. Why there is a gap. By the way, I do, I do do this. This is, uh, so hey, just watch the video. I'm going to give you a ban. I hate when people tell me how to run my stream. Just play the video. I'm going to also ban you. I, I don't, I don't want to see your messages. Just real talk. Okay, this is me talking about the video. It's, it's my choice to make. It's my choice to make that. Get him out. Rip bozos. Yeah, between no, nothing's more annoying than having someone tell you how to do everything, right? Like, I'm not here to make you happy. I'm here to talk about this video in the way I want to talk about it. You know what I mean? Like, that, that's, like that's how it works. That's how life works. If you don't like it, you don't have to. Okay? You know, I want you guys to be able to enjoy it. And if you guys can enjoy it, I try to make it enjoy. But I just try to talk about all the thoughts that come to my head. You know what I mean? It was performance and performance. Entertain me, Cloud! The reason is pretty simple. It's garbage collection. Since Go doesn't require you to deallocate memory once this you've allocated good. it, it needs to spend some amount of compute doing that for you. It keeps track of how many references a bit of data has, and when it runs out of memory or has a spare cycle, it looks through all of the memory references, sees if there's anything in memory that isn't currently being referenced, and it nukes it. In order to do that, yeah, it's very complicated. Garbage collection is super cool. By the way, hey, thank you everybody for the subs. This is the longest React video I've ever done. So this is we're like well into we're into an uh, we're into a long time right now. It has to take away some of your potential performance and your runtime in order to clean up the mess you left behind. And that is really good for the agility of you and your team as developers because you don't have to think about that problem anymore. And believe me, thinking about memory allocation will always make you slower. If there's anyone fair. who uses Rust Super that says take. they can build generic solutions to generic problems faster than a TypeScript dev can, they're lying through their goddamn teeth because... I actually completely agree with that. It's extremely like... There are, there probably does exist somebody that can, but they're doing like sin macros, right? They're like, they're popping out these like procedural macros that five people, right? Five people can do, right? You, to be able to do generic solutions to like that is, is extremely difficult. The borrow checker will always slow you down for iteration and specifically massive changes. If the architecture of what you're building changes, if the needs of your project change, if the spec changes while you're working on it, your ability to pivot and change Proc direction with Rust easy. is nearly zero because you have to bake okay. so much of your intention into the code in order for everything to work. With God. By the way, I do love Rust. The borrow checker slows you down such that you hopefully make better long-term decisions. That's the trade-off. The trade-off isn't pay me now. It's a pay me now versus pay me later trade-off. I think it's a good trade-off. It's a very interesting trade-off. I think we can all agree, but it doesn't mean it's perfect, right? Garbage collection, there's way less code that manages all of those things. And making these changes is significantly easier. But not everything needs to have that level of flexibility. There's a lot of projects and a lot of packages and pieces we use every day that are pretty rigid. Like the thing that reads a file from our system and gives us the result. Like a JSON parser. A lot of these tools and technologies are pretty rigid in how they work and what they do. So having to worry about those garbage collecting constantly in the background isn't great. The Go teams never pretended that, that garbage collection is magic and free and not going to cause performance issues that you wouldn't have in other languages. It makes you way quicker to write code, and it's not a big deal in terms Agreed. of the performance impact, but it is big enough. There are reasons why you... OCaml has some pretty interesting stuff on that. I, I still need to do a React video with TJ on the last, on the last OCaml article, but there's some pretty cool stuff that OCaml can do. You'd want to opt out of it. This is why Go had planned to introduce a new feature called Arenas, which, as I was recording this, I learned that it's on hold indefinitely. The goal here was to allow Damn. for perfect, so to speak, performance for core packages and reused pieces like it a is very file system to do reader or a I'm JSON happy parser. That the Since time. those have expected inputs and outputs that aren't going to change anytime. Is OCaml managed memory or garbage collected? It is garbage collected, but it has this idea of local and global and a couple other items that look kind of like Rust, except for it's not bound to the type, it's bound to the function, and you can technically get like stack allocation. It's pretty dang interesting. So it is definitely a managed memory, but it's managed memory in a very interesting way. I'm soon. It'd be a pretty good use case to not let garbage collection handle things there and just make memory safe code for yeah, the paths like that are the most reused collection. across Super all Go projects. I was really hyped on this proposal to the point where I was thinking a lot more about Go and taking it seriously. And that's why I'm heartbroken to have learned now that it's on hold indefinitely because it seemed like it would solve a lot of these problems. And most garbage collection problems in Go are fairly solved. Um, even like that whole Discord thing with the things being super, super slow. I mean, first off, that was just a really old version of Go that they were using where it does like a timed garbage collection. That's why the, that's why the spikes were so even. Uh, but B, there's a, lot, there's a lot better 
like Go has one of the best garbage collections. And now you, there's a lot of things you can do to, to tune it quite a bit. And if we go back to the diagram, it seemed like it gave Go the opportunity to slide way further this way. I think Go's and this way is why I'm concerned anyways. because Go seems perfectly happy sitting in the middle right here. And that's resulted in it not being that interesting to me. As we've hinted at a bunch throughout this and other videos, there are ways to push any technology a little bit in the other direction. JavaScript and TypeScript, we have some really cool stuff happening with Bun that's going to slowly expand the. It doesn't technically, I mean, you're, you're, that, that's the reason why Bun is so fast, especially with all the async stuff, is that if you look at Node, there's this, like this, it, there's this whole promises hook thing. This is where a bunch of like projects and all that can that can that can take advantage. This is how a data dog collects stuff and all that. Uh, Bun Bun just didn't do it. Bun Bun be like he gone, and so it's like it, it's faster because it's just not doing stuff. Promise hooks, right? There's a whole bunch of promise hooks and stuff like that. So it's like there's a whole bunch of async handling stuff that Node does that is more enterprisey than Bun does. You don't need those if you're not built like if you're building something different, it's a good trade-off to make. It's a trade-off you can make, but you just have to know that. Type of performance we can get out of our JavaScript code. With Rust, as the tools keep getting better, the education and resources continue to improve, and ideally the compiler gets faster and easier to work with, we'll see Rust getting easier and easier to adopt. But with I Go, I don't, think that's I don't know where they're going to end up. And that's the weird part for me. Let's say we start I really think Theo needs to actually talk to new developers on this because uh, the problem is is that all new developers that you you talk to are all trained in boot camps right now and they're all coming through with the pre-existing knowledge of javascript they forgot about the six months it takes of learning all the quirks of that language versus the month and a half it takes to learn all the quirks of go and so it's like i think there is just like a large difference here that is it, it is feeling a little it, i think go has significantly higher developer velocity and this is coming from someone who's never done Go in any serious reason until the last, like, three weeks. And now I'm like, oh, wow. Yeah, that's a lot faster than I thought. I'm a lot more productive than I ever thought I was going to be. And I think that just has to do with me building the things I want to build. So I'm not saying, you know, better or for worse. And I'm not even – by the way, that was not a shit on boot camps. Boot camps – I think, like, gen, real talk, I think more boot camps need to exist that are longer – like that's the real problem. Boot camps are too short, and that's where the fundamental problem comes out of. I think you need about two years of solid training to be able to get anywhere near it. And I think that if there's companies that would uh, participate in that, replace uni. I think I, I think university is great. I prefer university, but university does not make you practically useful. You will be more useful in four years due to a university, but boot camp makes you more useful in two years. I all like like the difference between a boot camp. And a uh, university is very, very simple. When you like here, here's the time period, right? So this is four years. This is a boot camp. You come out of a boot camp like getting pretty useful, and then I think you slow down because you have to really self learn to get better. And I don't think most people do that. Most people just do what they do. University, on the other hand, you are like this, but you have so much foundational knowledge that when you encounter problems, as you start doing it for real, you, you're, you're. Your, your peak is way, way higher. And so like after six years, almost always university people have a huge advantage over Basecamp people. The thing is, is that Basecamp people, they're like, like if this is the line of higher ability, like this is where it's at, right? This is where, this is where that higher is. And so bootcamp people have this illusion of being more useful quicker. But I think long-term, it's a lot of pain because they don't have all that foundational knowledge. So I'm not saying that you should do one or the other. That's why I'm saying I think boot camps need to be longer, right? I do just think that if you could go to a boot camp for two years, that really maybe takes a bit more like good stuff. I'm happy about that. Totally agree. Uni unis these days have terrible uh, 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 something, something terrible content, something someone disagrees about something. Um, I, I hate to tell you this, but you're wrong. Learning about a compiler is completely useless, and you will not be a great, a great practical software engineer. But you will understand JavaScript at a level in which no one coming out of a boot camp can. So is it useful? No. Yes. Well, it's hard. You can't really say it's you can't you can't really say it's it's useless. You can't really say it's useful. 
right? It's very, very difficult. And if someone does a lot during university, they can become extremely useful as they start applying practical knowledge to how much they understand about the underlying system. They take off much, much faster. Now, do I think that universities teach stupid stuff? Of course. A lot of times you're going to be learning Java. Like, I don't think that that's necessarily a good language choice these days. I'd much rather see them learn something else. Honestly, I'd rather see you learn C++ or Rust than Java, just because it's easy to learn Java when you know C++. It's not hard at all, right? Like, it's not hard to learn Java when you know these other languages. It's hard going the other direction. With JavaScript and TypeScript, and we start to hit performance issues. Like, the performance is here, but our team has now landed where our needs are at the very least here. And maybe every year our costs are getting higher, so our needs are shifting more and more towards performance. The weird part of the spectrum as it stands right now is that we start here where we just want to see if this thing works. We I think one more thing you got to take a take with this is that Theo also is a, a very big uh, React proponent. And I think React fundamentally makes Go hard. Like if you are doing React and you're building your UIs around React, I, I, I completely actually agree with Theo that using Go would be like a downgrade in velocity. So, so, I, so maybe this is actually a very accurate graph based on like what he has to build. I, I, I could actually completely buy that now that I think, now that I think about this. Uh, it is. React is very difficult to use with other languages. It just is. There's nothing, there's not like, there's not, that's not inappropriate take. It's a, it's a pretty normal take. Whereas like if you use something that's a little bit, like, you know, like if you had absolutely no framework and you Wild West your UI, you could use any language on the back end. It, there would be no there would be no no need to do anything, right? Whereas if you use something that forces you more and more into the like JavaScript ecosystem, it's harder and harder to break out of the JavaScript ecosystem. Like you would have to have only very back end services be in Go, and then you'd have to have a middle layer that is gonna be React server components. You know what I mean? Like it, they're, they're, you you will really have to think about these things. It's just different. Slide more and more. And then we hit this point where JavaScript and TypeScript might be hackable for better performance, but it's not going to be a great experience overall. And then we have a long ways to go before these other solutions make sense. By the way, I don't think React is, is garbage. I think React is very, very interesting. I love what it I, I love some of the ideas it brought to the ecosystem. I am happy with some things. It's just not for me. I find it I, I just I personally think it just makes things more difficult eventually. I think when you're first starting off, I think it's very easy to see the UI as React is built. I think JSX is a natural way in which your brain works to build a UI. But I think that overall, you will have a more complicated project that's he that's harder to scale as as features go up. Like that's why I don't. That's why I just simply don't use it. I like. I don't like that. You know what I mean? Like that's just not for me. You know what I mean? And you this uncanny I mean? valley is where Go that's is strongest. And as such, I think it's a great opportunity to continue expanding left so that the team doesn't have to change technologies. Right now, my general recommendation for companies is to start with JavaScript and TypeScript if they don't have immediate massive performance need to have something faster or more maintainable. And when they hit the point where the performance of this solution is bad enough, that's when you eat the cost and move to Rust. So I actually disagree with that take uh, fundamentally. I think it's easier to start with Go and HTMX on almost all universal projects. Most projects I see are just extremely simple, and they need exceptionally little front-end logic. Uh, there's front-end logic only because you use something like React, right? You baked in the logic and the state management in into itself. I think it's honestly, I think, you could, I think you could build any product significantly faster using Go and HTMX than you could JavaScript and React and all those things. Now, obviously, right now, React has the most focus, so I think it's probably easier at this current moment to do login and all these different things using React because there's just there is a very well built e ecosystem around it. I would love to see if if I mean if HTMX had the same level of ecosystem when it comes to logging in and some of those other items such as you know checking out and all that. I think it could be I think it could honestly be uh, just a giant rival. It's just that I don't want to uh, I like me personally I don't want to do that. If you're building a spa, I wouldn't agree. I think that it's easier to build a spa with HTMX. I like Theo, by the way. So any, anyone that thinks like I'm going against Theo, I like to have these conver conversations with Theo because we agree to disagree, and that's great. I drew these lines really strong, but the reality is all of these things are way blurrier than I might have led you to believe here.
In fact, I would argue that these are near touching. As a result, the so time you would spend in that theoretical bad zone good. here isn't that big. And if you know where your performance needs are, it's a lot easier to make a decision. This is also why Go is so interesting because many companies just will never be here. For example, Twitch, like Twitch's internal services will almost always get enough traffic that spinning them up on a JavaScript server that has really bad error management and might crash in various unexpected ways is just not a real option for you. And as such, Go allows you to compromise. By the way, that's a, that's a very fair take. And also, I want you to take a quick second and realize what he just said there. Dev velocity is not containing error management. So for me, that's part of dev velocity is being able to make a strong service that can live ad infinitum. And so for me, that's a very important part. And so I think we could also, we, we may just simply define dev velocity slightly different. And I think that's okay. Like, I think that's okay because that's, it's a made up word that doesn't make any sense. And it is completely relative to everybody that uses it, right? A little bit of that velocity in order to go way further down the spectrum of performance. But if you want something that handles every single byte in memory as efficiently as possible, Go will never be the solution for that, especially now that arenas Fair. are killed. That all said, I've seen Rust being adopted for way too many problems that fit squarely within Go's wheelhouse. A common one that I'm seeing nowadays is compilation. We have a really fast compiler for TypeScript now. It's called ESBuild. It was created by Evan Wallace during the end of his time as CTO of Figma because he wanted the JavaScript and TypeScript builds for Figma and other companies with these huge code bases to be faster. And he concluded that JavaScript was the wrong language to do that work. He picked Go as the language for ESBuild. And the result is a core piece of tooling that is used by almost every modern JavaScript solution. If you've used Vite before, Vite is built on top of Rollup and ESBuild. Yes, build in dev and roll up in prod. That's why. The By the way, if you use like SWC, SWC is really good too. It's just that it doesn't have as much features. Um, and S if I'm not mistaken, e SWC doesn't support um, decorators yet. I might be wrong on that one. I, I know I, I looked at something and I know either ES build or SWC doesn't support decorators. One of the two do, uh, don't, but like there's still some things that are interesting about it, but the difference in performance is fairly negligible. Meaning, if you're compiling ten thousand files, you're, ta you're, you're, you're talking in the um, you're talking in the millisecond range that they're going to be different. So it's like, why not do something that can? Why not use a move fast language to build something that can keep up with features? The reload times. If you use so decorators, fast, you don't deserve ESBuild your code compiled through Go. Sadly, if we look it's at so the contribution chart for ESBuild, you'll see very clearly the vast, vast majority is Evan by like a lot. And when you compare this to other devs, like the next biggest has 4,000 lines added and 16 commits. Evan has 3,800 commits. Yeah. This is a one-man band. And rather than try to fork it or build into it or build more around ES build, Evan it feels Giga like Jed. everyone's been trying to reinvent it in Rust. Now we have SWC, RS Pack, Turbo Pack, Rolldown, which is a rewrite of Rollup in Rust. It seems like as the ecosystem realized the need for faster JavaScript compilation, we left behind one of the most valuable parts. We left behind Go. And I don't know if that was the right call. All of the Rust based... By the way, great take by Theo. I think this is a really good take. I think that a lot of these projects could have been delivered sooner using Go. Maybe they are. Maybe they are faster. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm positive. Uh, I am positive that they're faster. But, but I really like that. I actually genuinely like this JavaScript compilers. Should I've have considered Go. Have had a really slow adoption life cycle and even slower iteration. SWC just hasn't kept up in terms of feature additions. It's getting there, but it just hasn't gotten there yet. Turbo Pack has notoriously been a mess and they've massively de-scoped the project in order to try and get it to actually ship. It seems like a lot of these projects that committed to doing what ESBuild did, but in Rust instead of Go, have ended up stuck in development hell. And I don't know how much that is to blame Rust versus the project management versus the massive goals and scope of a lot of these projects. All I can look at is the results and say definitively that ESBuild has still had the best results of anything in these tools. And I don't know why we didn't learn more from this project. I've talked to a lot of dev. Great take. I love, I, absolutely spot on, I think, with this take, which is, uh, I love, I mean, I, the problem with the Rust side is that did you hire the right people? Were the right people involved? Was it a bunch of people that were novices at Rust being excited about it being fast? And, uh, you know, you could have, it could have led to just really bad 
stuff, right? I think that really talented Rust engineers can most certainly write all these things very, very well. But I, I don't know if the average Rust person can write some of these things as well. I'm very, very, very... I'm impressed with the, I, I'm genuinely impressed with this take because I think it's very balanced, which is we should have used – there's easier languages that get the 99, right? They get 99. Go is literally like 98% of the performance of the average Rust av- application. The average Go and the average Rust is probably different by that much. You know, to work on a lot of these things. And most of them don't have a good answer either. It feels like they went with Rust take, because it's Rust the best never used solution. And if we go back Rust to my diagram, no talking about, if you're over here, if you live in this hot. world – and That's you're hot. in constant pain because of it. You're stuck dealing with these languages that just aren't fast enough for what you want to do. It makes sense that when you look over the fence and you see rust on the other side, that's what you want to reach for and grab and use. But the fence, the thing in between the two, that thing is go. And I'm honestly feeling a little bit of guilt because I have been part of writing that off. So I've always said, like, if you're on this side... Did Theo actually just mention Chesterton's fence? Are we accidentally having a Chesterton's fence moment right now? Damn. Damn, we're having a Chesterton's fence moment, aren't we? Oh, it feels good. It feels good. And you need to be on the other side. Just go to the other side. But there's this whole space between that we ignore because we strive to jump the gap. JavaScript compilation doesn't need to be perfectly memory safe. JavaScript compilers don't need to be in a language that requires you manage every byte of memory and handle borrow checking and all of these things correctly. JavaScript compilation doesn't need to be as complex as Rust allows. And I honestly think we would be in a better place as an ecosystem if JavaScript had centralized a little more around Go instead of Rust. But I could be wrong here too. The same way I was wrong in believing Go was a bad choice for us in web dev, I might be wrong that Rust will dig us out of this eventually. It's very possible that by the end of the year, maybe even by the end of the month, we'll see a lot of those projects I was talking about before get to the point where I can meaningfully adopt them. But the harsh reality is, I've shipped ES build in production many a time. I've never really shipped these other alternatives. I think we use the SWC compiler in Next now for some of the transpilation, but it's still Webpack at its core. I think Go has a really good opportunity in this middle ground, but again, which is kind of the theme of the video, by not being one of those extremes, Go has ended up being significantly less interesting. I'm just curious how the rest of y'all feel, because the more I've soul searched, the more I've realized that I kind of didn't give Go the credit it deserved for where it sits. And even though I just learned arenas aren't happening and that has definitely tapered my hype around Go once again, I do think it's important to not leave behind as we learn more lessons about the tools and technologies we're building with. And I still think that just maybe we screwed up going all in on Rust when we had a good enough language right there. How do you feel about all this? And am I being too negative about Rust? I think... I think Pick, you said it best. Go is mid, and it's and it's perfect like that. I, I think that's one of the hardest parts about Go. I think Go's biggest adoption problem is not anything except for what Theo said at the very beginning. I want to feel smart. And I think complex types that really perfectly say exactly what you want, that are very, very exactly super amazing autocomplete, being able to hit it with the generic sub doing all these things, blah, 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 blah. I think that it's very, very easy to see to see that and want that. Whereas I just don't believe it's actually that useful. Right? I think that it, it just feels good, and at the end of the day, it's not great. Go is pretty boring. The only exciting thing it has right now is generics, and it's not even that useful. Exactly. They're like kind of useful, kind of useful generics. Uh, they're useful enough that you can now do a bunch of array operations, right? And you can also do options now. So it's like, that's that's really good. Uh, good video. I thought this video was very good, by the way. If you, uh, I think this video was very, very, very well done. Always watch it to the end. If you want to be more negative about it, I'll pin a video in the corner where I do just that. Good seeing you guys as always. See you later. Peace nerds. Oh, there we go. I thought that was great. I thought it was a great video. I think there's a lot to it. Go generics are actually well done for Go. I cannot grumble about them too much. Neither can I. I mean, they're very simple, and they keep it simple, right? You can do what you need to do without without all the – like, the thing is is that I would have been sad if they would have added in the complexity of TypeScript or uh, Rust into it. Like, that would have been sad for me. I would have really disliked it. I think this video was great. I know you're saying it was okay. I think this video was great because this video was – like, the thing that uh, – a video that I like – is a video that makes me argue with myself. A video I don't like is one where I pat myself on the back being like, ooh, yeah, I was right. Oh, yeah, this is correct. Right? I actually find those videos to be one of the most 
Like, those are, like, the most boring videos. This is a good video because it made me really think, like, am I even correct on what I think? And I actually found myself half agreeing with Theo, half not agreeing with Theo. I know I was more vocal about the things I don't agree with him on, but that's because I think it's boring just to be like, oh, yeah, hell yeah, hell yeah. And then, like, what am I going to expound on? Say what he said again, right? Is he your brother? No, he's not. All right. Let's see. Velocity-wise, in my opinion, a go belongs all the way to the right, only exception being what you said about RSAZ. I think that's where things get confusing. Um, I don't know. I liked it. Do you two share mustache tips? No. We shared mustaches. Um, not just the tips. Uh, I don't know. I, I enjoyed it. Go doesn't, let's see, Go doesn't make tight masturbate, uh, ma- masturbator erect. The only problem. And honestly, that is a real problem. It is a real problem of, of Go is that it is boring. And people don't want boring. But I, in my older age, am fine right now with boring. I'm going through a very, like, I'm going through the renaissance of boring is what I like to call it. Uh, I've just been all about trying to be as boring as possible in every last thing I'm doing. Because if I don't, I'm going to be really sad. By the way, what's coming up next uh, for all those people that are on YouTube, for all those people that are on Twitch, we have a pretty exciting set of things coming up. I want to let you know. I, I'm very excited about the planet scale thing. I even have a special guest coming on here very so- soon. Uh, Theo looks like Owen Wilson's Mobius character. Dude, by the way, Owen Wilson and Theo, that's a fun, that's a good one. That's a much better one. So I'm very excited about all this. The name. It's the Primogen. 